this afternoon. Thanks very much for coming. If you have a Bible, you could turn it with me to Acts chapter 16. Otherwise, you could just follow in our reading. And uh, I would like to read from verse 14 of Acts chapter 16. Acts 16 and verse 14. Uh, just over the last few Sundays when we've spoken, we've been looking at some of what we've called the great gospel verses. That is, little parts of the Bible that kind of sum up, in a way, uh, the key message, the core message of the Bible. The Bible's a big book. It's been written over thousands of years, and uh, about 40 different people have contributed to it. So there's a lot of stuff in it. Um, but the core message is, in, in essence, very simple. And, and any of the great ideas, as you know, of history always have a very... A simple core message, and so too the Bible. It deals with, first of all, who we are, and secondly, what we are, that we've fallen from the way that God made us, and how we can be right with God. And the solution to that problem comes not by ourselves or what we have done, but the solution to our fallenness, our brokenness, and our sin comes from what God has done in giving his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So there you have a 20-second summary of the Bible. Uh, but, uh, of course, there's a lot more to it. But that is the key message. And uh, the call of this great book is for us to respond to that and to take a step of faith, as we'll see in the reading of Acts 16. So we're breaking into the history of the early days of the church, the preaching of Paul in a place called Philippi. And Acts 16.14 takes us way back uh, 2,000 years ago to the city of Philippi, and verse 14 says, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended to the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay with us. And she constrained us. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, a young woman possessed with the spirits, as a demon-possessed girl, um, met us, which brought her master's much gain by soothsaying. So a sense of fortune teller, uh, maybe a, a spiritist, somebody that would be involved with doing seances, that kind of a thing. She would tell you your future and maybe tell you something of your past. And people were making money out of it, as they do today. If you go along to any of these places, the first thing probably they'll do, and certainly the last thing they'll do is ask you for money. And that's that's what was happening. It hasn't changed in 2,000 years uh, at least. Um, and so uh, this young demon-possessed uh, girl, uh, verse 17, the same followed Paul and does and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. Strange, but we'll come back to that in a minute. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and threw, drew him into the marketplace to the rulers and brought him to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes, whipped them, uh, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we're all here. And then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your house. And they spoke to him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized and all his straight way. And uh, just those two verses in particular that I have in particular mind, 
verse number 30 asks a question, what must I do to be saved? And the Apostle Paul gives the answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Let's just ask for God's help, shall we? Our Father, we do just come in to thy presence again this afternoon. We give thanks for the word of God. We know, our Father, that this word is living, is powerful, and is able to speak to us, not only generally about the way of salvation, not just generally about who we are and where we're heading, uh, and not just generally about the person of the Lord Jesus, but we know, our Father, this word is living. It's able to speak to us where we are, in the circumstances that we're in, in a personal and individual way. And so we ask, Father, for the grace of thy Holy Spirit to be able to, to use the word that is sown this afternoon. Use it, our Father, for our blessing, our help, uh, and for the glory of the Lord Jesus, uh, even, Father, uh, to the saving of souls, as we've been reading here in these verses. Give us help, our Father, we pray, as we ask our Father for this, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, we've been thinking a little over the last wee while about great gospel verses and uh, I'm, I'm cheating of course this afternoon because I'm not just going to give you one great gospel verse, I'm going to give you two, but they're really important because they go hand in hand. One is a question and the other is an answer, so you can forgive me uh, for using two. The question, very simple, what must I do to be saved? And the next verse, the answer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Now, I have a little question in my own mind as I'm thinking about these verses, and the question maybe I could just sow in, in your mind too, you might take it away and think about it, is what would it take to change your mind? What would it take to change your mind? And as you go down through Acts 16, we're going to see the way that God changes a person's mind. It's something that I have to deal with on a fairly regular basis, sadly, uh, in, in my line of work is, trying to convince people to change their mind, often about bad habits, about eating habits and smoking habits and drinking habits, and, and you often hit your head against a brick wall. And tragically, sometimes, when it comes to them changing their mind eventually, it's maybe at times too late. The diagnosis has been made and so, far, so forth. But in Acts chapter 16, we see the way that God changes people's minds, and it's very interesting, and we want to think about that uh, this afternoon. Now, Acts 16 is set against the background of a mighty work of God. Uh, the Apostle Paul has been preaching in a place called Philippi, and uh, someone has got saved, uh, Lydia, a seller of purple. She's uh, a wealthy woman, it would seem, and she comes to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the beginning of Acts chapter 16, you maybe get a little glimpse right at the beginning of the way that God actually changes this woman's life, because we'll see it echoing later on in the chapter. She's a woman who hears the word of God. If you have your Bible, Acts chapter 16 and verse number 14, uh, at the end there, she says she attended to the things which were spoken of Paul. And Paul was a preacher of the gospel. That's what he brought to people. He didn't bring primarily miracles or anything fancy. If you were to read what he wrote at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, he tells you what he brought to people. We preach Christ and him crucified. That was our bottom line. And it was that message that transformed the world, turned people's lives upside down, utterly changed people. The presentation of the fact that God loved us in spite of our sin. The presentation of the fact that God loved us and actually acted upon his love and sent his son to die in the place that we ought to have died. And that God extends this free forgiveness. And that shattered the world of paganism that said you only get what you pay for, that the way to God is a path of religion, of doing things, of offering sacrifices, of getting enrolled in a religious system. Paul says, no, it's not. God isn't interested in that. There's nothing that you can do that can pay to God the cost of your sins. It just doesn't work like that. The cost of your sins is insurmountable. You've offended an eternal and a holy God, and there is nothing you can do that can take your life and make it perfect, because that's the standard for God. So forget your religions, forget your cults, uh, forget your paganism, it's not going to work. Never mind sacrificing your sheep and your goats, that's not going to change your life, it's just going to make a mess. But let me show you something that can change your life. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is able to forgive your sins because he paid the price for your sins and he's able to make you a new creation. And that turned the world upside down. Lydia, at the beginning of Acts 16, or the middle of Acts 16, she gets it. She gets it. And it turns her life upside down. She hears 
the Word of God. And with that hearing of the Word of God, you, you, you'll find here that God does a work in our life, a work in our heart. Verse 14, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended. So there's a work of God and there's the Word of God. And two, those two things go hand in hand right the way down through Acts 16. A person hears the Word of God. And as he, as he or she hears the word of God, God begins to work in their, in their heart. And they begin to understand what's been said. And it comes to them in a personal way. And they see the reality of sin. And they see the possibility of salvation and forgiveness. And they get a glimpse of how great life could be with God. He does the work in their heart. And he brings them to faith in Jesus Christ. And lives are transformed. Now, in the midst of such a tremendous work, there's a problem. The kind of problem you don't want. Satan takes an interest in what Paul is doing. That's anticipatable in many ways, at least the Apostle Paul anticipated that. And so in verse 16, as this great work is being done, Satan uh, puts his oar in. Mm. Now, it seems to be uh, on the surface maybe just a little bit of um, a little bit strange because here, this demon-possessed uh, girl, uh, this uh, person that perhaps would be regarded as a spiritist and so forth these days, um, she, she begins to speak, verse 17. And the strange thing is that what she says is true. <laughs> Nothing actually wrong with it. That's a strange thing. Verse 17. And the same followed Paul and does and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. Now, that's true. That is true. These men were the servants of the Most High God. The Apostle Paul hadn't always been that, mind you. He had been the servant, really, of, of, of Satan in many ways, persecuting Christ and the church and throwing people into, into prison and, 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 and trying to obstruct the gospel. He's really doing the devil's work. But the Lord Jesus Christ got a grip of his life and converted him in the Damascus Road, brought him to a knowledge of his sins and a glimpse of the glory of the Lord Jesus. And he was a servant of the Most High God, and he did show the way of salvation. But listen, if there's something that you really don't want, in, uh, to, to, if, there's, if there's an endorsement you really don't want if you're preaching the truth, it's the endorsement of a liar. And Satan is the prince of lies. You really don't want a liar endorsing the truth. And if you're preaching a life that saves life, a message that saves lives and transforms life, you really don't want the interest of a murderer. And Satan was a murderer from the beginning. And if you're preaching something that is full of profound life-changing truth that reveals the depth of the love of God and the power of God to transform lives, you don't want it rubber stamped by a madman or a mad woman. You definitely don't want that. You want it clear and simple, a word from God. And here, of course, it is someone and they're serving Satan. And they do, I suppose, what a lot of people do. Avoid it, please, avoid it. Did you notice what she said? These men are servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. She's got the attitude of many today. This message of, oh, this Bible message, this Christianity, would be really good for you. Have you ever heard anything like that? I hear that quite a lot. It would be really good for you. It would be really good for him. You know, the, the chap with the, the, the drug problem or the chap with the drink problem or, or the woman with, 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 with all sorts of problems. It'd be really good for them. Not for me. I'm all right, thanks very much. I hear that a lot, actually. It would really do them the world of good if they came to the church. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is it's good for all of us, beginning with me. And so here's the devil doing what the devil often does, hypocritical, yeah, hypocritical. Uh, the father of lies endorsing the word of God. You don't want anything to do with that. And so the apostle Paul acts on, on that. The apostle Paul sets this Get all free. It's the second miracle of salvation in many ways in this wonderful chapter. It, it, we've already seen Lydia, a life transformed. And then here's a young woman and she's in the grips of Satan. And now she's been set free. And in response to the freedom that the gospel has given this young woman, Satan gets Paul locked up. He loses his freedom. Which brings us into the rest of the story, if you can follow it so far. The the background, a tremendous working of grace, a tremendous working of the power of God. People are getting saved. They're dropping literally like flies under the power and grace of God. 
people that that people that that were involved with paganism and then Satanism, uh, and maybe we're going to get the hardest nut to crack so far in the next in this jailer, and uh, he is charged with putting Paul and Silas in prison. Now, it would seem from this a character of a man that we've got here at the end of Acts 16, <clears throat> that there's zero sympathy at all towards the gospel, zero sympathy at all towards God's grace, zero sympathy at all towards the message of the Bible. But God is going to do a work in his heart that's going to transform him. And I do pray, I do trust that it doesn't take this to change our mind about God or to change our mind about the Lord Jesus. But this man is brought to the very edge of utter despair. He's brought to the edge of suicide. He's at the point of taking his own life before eventually something happens, which is uh, maybe pictured here in Acts 16, but <clears throat> it perhaps becomes more literal for us. Uh, verse number 29, if you've got your Bible, I'll just read it. It says, and he called for a light and sprang in. <laughs> That's interesting. It always strikes me, that little verse. A man that's in, in deep darkness. The picture, of course, is Paul and Silas cast into prison, into the inner prison. It's at midnight. It's in the darkest point of the night. And then, as things look bleak and dark in the prison, in the inner prison, at the darkest point of the night, as things look bleak and dark, it gets even darker and more difficult. The earthquake hits. And it's at that point, at that point, everything changes. And this uh, keeper of the prison, this jailer, <clears throat> verse 27, let's break in a little just towards the end of that section. Verse 27, and the keeper of the prison, waiting out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. And Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell before uh, Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, can I just highlight here? Well, this man asks a really important question. And it's a question that goes beyond these immediate circumstances. There's lots of uh, there's lots of background to this, 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 this chapter. Lots of bad things happening. There's the background of the demonic that we mentioned earlier on. There's the background of the darkness that's at midnight. There's the background of the disaster of the earthquake. But this man is 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 this man has a grasp of something even deeper than that, deeper than the darkness that surrounds him and the demonic that is there. What must I do? To be saved. And the answer to that question is a spiritual answer. It's not about being saved from the darkness or the earthquake. And the answer to that question, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Here's what I'm getting at. It takes all of that for that man to see where he actually is. It takes all of that disaster in the background. It takes the potential loss of of his place and position, the loss of his job, the potential for his punishment, the earthquake that hits the prison at the darkest point of night, for this man actually to waken up to the reality of life and death. And then it hits him. And the question he asks is not how can I get out of the prison or how can I get away from the earthquake, but what must I do to be saved? And that question is a spiritual question because it has a spiritual answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And that man grasps that spiritual question, that spiritual answer. He grasps it and he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and as you go down the, the, the chapter, you'll see that his life is transformed. Verse 33 Instead of being involved probably in the whipping of, of Paul and Silas, he washed their stripes and he was baptized. That wasn't a light thing to do in those days. You were really turning your back in Rome and turning your back in paganism, probably turning your back in, on your family. You were setting yourself up for persecution, but he got baptized. He washed their stripes. He set a meal before them. And verse 34, he rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Here was a life utterly transformed. But mind you, it took a lot to get him there. 
It took a lot to get him there. And as, as I read those verses uh, this afternoon, two perhaps of the great gospel verses that we often think about, two of the simplest and the plainest of the gospel verses that you'll find uh, in the Bible, a question and answer verse. What do I have to do to get saved? The answer Equally as straightforward and simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. It's so simple in many ways, but it takes a man, it takes a man to get to the deepest, darkest part of his life before he can actually see it. It takes a man to, to be able to, to grasp the, the truth and the reality of that only once his life is actually in danger. It takes so much to happen for the man to see it. I trust then maybe we can see it before we're brought to the place that that man was brought to. What must I do to be saved? Not just from the darkness and the despair and the, uh, and the disasters round about us, but the salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, offers is an eternal salvation. You'll read about that in John's Gospel. I give unto my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. It's a salvation that lasts forever. He's able to save forever all that come to him by faith because he ever lives. It's a salvation that involves, that brings us into a living relationship with the God of heaven. And it's a salvation that guarantees us heaven and a home forever. A step of faith, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That seems deceptively simple. Yeah, perhaps it will take us uh, some deep work of God for us just to grasp that, that we might take that simple step of faith and trust the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we do come into thy presence this afternoon. We thank thee for the living word of God, powerful and clear in so many ways. We thank our Father of the way that thou didst speak there in the prison. And we remember our Father that the voice of God was heard in a sense in the earthquake, in a sense in the despair and the darkness. Uh, and we thank you, our Father, that the voice of God was heard in the words of the Spirit of God. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And we give thanks, our Father, that thou art able to save forever all that come to thee by faith. We thank thee, our Father, for the work of the Lord Jesus. And we give thanks, our Father, that as we glimpse the message of this book that we glimpse the person of thy son we see him our father not simply as a good example or not simply as a, a teacher of great things but we see him our father as our savior our lord and savior we get a glimpse of him as the eternal son of god the one be before whom uh, demons would tremble and we get a glimpse of the one our father that is able to transform lives to bring hope to the hopeless light into the darkness life to the dead and we thank thee, our Father, that he's the one who has once suffered for sin, uh, the just, the perfect one, for we the unjust, that he might bring us to God. We offer thanks, our Father, for the Lord Jesus. We thank thee, our Father, for the great message of the gospel. And we pray, Father, that thy word would speak to each of our hearts this afternoon as we offer thanks, our Father, for hope uniquely in the Lord Jesus. Uh, we offer that thanks in his name for his glory.